All right. Welcome to the Bridge Podcast. I'm here today with Ellen Fullman. Ellen, for those who aren't familiar, is a uh, some might call her a composer, some might call her a sculptor, um, probably best known for her long string instrument, uh, which is a uh, crazy sort of spectacular contraption of just intonated strings that are played with rosin fingers. Um, but I'm very excited to talk to you today, Ellen. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I often start these podcasts just asking for a sort of window into everybody's personality by asking what the relationship is with coffee out of my own sort of religious conviction for the beverage. Um, is coffee something that you drink or uh, do you have a preferred beverage that you have an affinity for? Well, it's funny that you should ask because I um, uh, not only, um, you know, uh, not only can I uh, uh, pull a shot and uh, do latte art, on it but i roast my own beans excellent okay and my preference is um i like ethiopian beans i i try like a variety um the thing that i like about ethiopian um well for one thing it's the source of co of all coffee ethiopia and i really um enjoy the kind of um berry like flavors in that uh and citrus mm -hmm. um and there is a kind of like, um, I don't, I guess it's the acid or something, but it's like, there's just a, more inspiration for me <laughs> in Ethiopian coffee. What's your take on it? What on do you coffee like? Or on Ethiopian coffee? Well, just um, like, what's your, I mean, you're, I, I think it goes with, with art and music and, you know, it's very much a source of my inspiration for my mm -hmm. entire adult life. I mean, I started in high school and, you know, just it studio and coffee it goes together for me exactly yes yeah. um i feel exactly the same uh i mean like i i like to think that on the spectrum of like not a coffee drinker to david lynch i'm somewhere closer to david lynch where um you know it's essential for getting me excited and like getting some momentum inspiration wise um mm -hmm. i also i love ethiopian coffees um I'm curious uh, if you also like Kenyan coffees, because I, I know some people are put off by that sort of variety of acid, but um, they might not be put off by the, uh, you know, the flavors of Ethiopia. Do you like Kenyan coffees? <laughs> um, yes, I have. But um, OK, um, I uh, use cream and sugar, so I kind of, you know, <laughs> I'm not so subtle, you know, in my palate, perhaps, but um, I've I've in the past roasted uh, Kenyan coffees, I mean, I, f I feel there's something like similar. Um, what would you say is the difference? I mean, I guess um, like the Kenyan coffees always have this like dense sort of uh, like current flavor to it uh, or like uh, sometimes almost tomatoey. And like, I, I feel like that would probably be almost, almost curdling of the milk. Uh, so it probably isn't great for that. Or... Well, that's what people say about you know, like cappuccinos with Ethiopian, you know, that is kind of like a citrus and milk is like don't go together. But well, I had, um, I, I had um, in Cleveland um, from a um, coffee house that specialized in, in Ethiopian cappuccinos, like single origin. I was just like, I thought, I really like this. I know you're not supposed to. But. <laughs> I mean, I think that's great. Uh, like a single origin cappuccino is so much more interesting than just like, you know, the one with the blend where they threw in a bunch of, you know, sort of cheap coffee to round out the flavor or whatever. Well, I can't stand that. I can't stand that. You know, I don't know. Um, I don't drink coffee out very often. I mean, there's, we've got like one, like really high tech technical place down the street that I'll go to every once in a while and and it's good um but um I just you know like as far as like getting a Starbucks or something I I really yeah don't enjoy that so you just do it on your own that's that's the move to do it um I uh cheaper roasting okay you get the green beans for uh 650 a pound and you go out you know to buy like a gourmet roast you know, it's, you know, over 20, so mm -hmm. cheaper. Are you, are you using like a, a sample roaster or a, No, I mean, it's, like... um, I, I have this, there's like this whole like 
you know, like area of home roasting with um, roasters that'll do up to a pound. Um, okay. And uh, what I have is called the Baymore. It's the cheapest brand for home roasting it was like 300 something dollars. And it's kind of looks like a toaster oven and it has like a drum that it's a drum that spins. And it's not as powerful as like some, like a thousand dollars. You know, I've seen like these models, you know, that are really, where you can really like bump up the temperature hotter and everything, but it, it tastes good. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> and it's, um, it's a good, it's a good, uh, in, you know, a, a, a good buy. So I'm, I'm glad that your, your preferences are the correct preferences. So, <laughs> you know, what's uh, correct? It, your preferences in coffee. I'm just like, uh, seeing some composers play, don't have the the correct <laughs> response in your opinion <laughs> my assumption honestly was that you wouldn't be a coffee drinker just because of the like I'm level so of mellow. steadiness <laughs> yeah but um I, I was proven wrong uh yeah, good answer uh so um to get into some like uh stuff first with instrument design uh, i know you've been researching uh, a lot about this for a while and when i was thinking about instrument design you know i I Googled it, you don't really get much, and then you realize, okay, you have to type musical instrument design, but even then it's kind of like learn luthery or like something where it's like more instrument maintenance almost. Um, so I was like, what is instrument design? Um, and it seems maybe your immediate interest was in the materials, um, but then also like sort of the physics of it. Uh, so w in terms of a bird's eye view, how do you think of instrument design and sort of like the subcategories of it? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's been it's been decades long process of thinking about it and trying things um, here and there. Um, but um, you know, initially I came across this sound uh, accidentally, exploring, trying to look for a good sound, you know. But but then it was uh, the the thought came, well, how can I make this better? How can, what what would make it better? Because um, and you know, and I, um, I I came across a. Uh, an instrument builder in Austin, Texas, Stephen Wise. Um, he makes basses. Um, he's done a few different things, harps and things. I was in contact with him in the 1980s. And um, so I discussed it with him and I commissioned him to build resonator boxes for me. And the, the main issue I thought at the time was that I needed spruce top wood. I needed solid wood. I was building boxes out of plywood. And it worked, you know, but I just thought, you know, I can make, I can make the timbre better. I, what I really wanted was an acoustic sound, you know, um, that, yeah, an, a, a more beauty, like in the acoustic sound. Um, okay, so he, he, the, he was a vast improvement, the things that he made. He made a plywood box, but with a nice uh, sound board that, um, and he came up with a design of, of a modular box um, where the soundboard can be removed. And in this way, then because I would go into all kinds of weird environments where there's like, it might be damp, it might be dry, you know, and, mm. and so to prevent like that uh, cracking of the joints, the soundboard just floats uh, inside this plywood box. But, but uh, you know, I worked with that for 20 years and it was, you know, that was, it was better than what I had before. But then all along thinking, you know, like, well, could it be better? And my background, as you noted, is sculpture. So I feel a comfort, level of comfort in working with materials and just taking a shot at things because in art school, that's what you do. You just try stuff. Mm -hmm. you, you don't work in the mode of the old masters. You try stuff, you invent. Invention is what's valued, okay? In conservatories, no. You follow in the mold of what has been done and you try to keep it going. I really dislike that very much. I really like invention. So, but I also, um, I think I, my father modeled for me like just uh, a way of living where you just try stuff. You don't, you're not the expert, mm -hmm. you just take a shot at things. And so I felt, I didn't feel inhibited to just say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to learn how to do this and I'm going to see what I can do because, you know, I would need to invest, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to like try to commission a really good instrument designer to come up with um, something because 
really what I'm doing has never been done before. There's no model for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do is to try to um, just kind of composite together, you know, things about, you know, violin making or guitar making or marimba bar keys. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, there's just things about wood resonating that I just gleaned, you know, thoughts about, and I put it together. Um, So, you know, uh, I started getting more serious about this um, about five years ago. And then I, I just dipped in to woodworking, like, because it's all encompassing. It's like, you're covered in sawdust, you're, there's loud noise, you know, like everything's all torn apart. Like my instrument, I had to take it apart and try new components. And it was just testing and listening to that. It was a whole other process than composing. So I just dropped everything and did that for like two or three months at a time. Like I started, I don't know, uh, uh, it, like I said, it was about five years ago and I would dip in and then I made an improvement. I started to make solid mahogany boxes and that was better than the plywood box that Steve made. Um, it had a better tone, but I came to learn later that the mahogany I was using was low quality. It wasn't like the wonderful musical sounding mahogany it's not really available anymore. Like, and what I was using is like this kind of spongy stuff that's available now that's, it doesn't sound good. And it took me a long time to realize that. I mean, it's just like, I'm learning along the way. Um, Okay, so then um, the real improvement came a couple of years ago when I, I was just reading all about online, you know, as you say, you can just like try to glean bits and pieces of information, Rosewood. Rosewood is like the most wonderful resonant wood. Guitar bodies, wonderful, you know, Spanish guitar, guitars are, the body is made with rosewood. It resonates. It just feels wonderful. Um, Cellos are not made with rosewood because, I mean, I'm trying to think, think about this from an outsider point of view. You don't want them to resonate like that. Guitars, you're playing a chord, it's harmony. You want everything to ring and just sustain. Cello, melody. You don't want the note that was previously played to keep interfering with the new material. So cellos are made with um, maple, the body. Okay, It's nice. It resonates somewhat, but not like rosewood. And the, the top wood on all instruments is always spruce. So I tried to like, and the process, I'm inventing something totally new. But then I go with what are classics, classic materials that are proven to work, Mm -hmm. okay? So if I start with that point of view, um, and um, I'm, so I built these rosewood boxes and they really sound nicer. And then later, like a a, a couple, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I, I guess I, I don't have the timeline in my mind. It's, it's in the last five years, like dipping in and out. Um, but I um, took on the idea of the soundboard um, because I wanted to see if I could make a better soundboard than Steve's um, boards be, because I thought his bridge material uh, is, um, um, it's mahogany. It's a, it's a nicer old mahogany, but what about ebony as a as a bridge material? Because like some of the finest instruments, you know, finest guitars have an ebony bridge. And it, and I discovered ebony in the in the in the in the um, in the uh, have a fantastic um, hardwood store that's really just a few blocks from here. That's like one of the best in America. Uh, it's Macbeth, um, and and I they had um, some pieces of of ebony, and I just listened to it. and It was just like like a bell, such a beautiful tone. So, you know, I just changed to these materials and, um, you know, so it's really empirical how I I work. And then I thought also like the idea, like watching these videos of uh, violin making where the, the, the top is tapered and there's, you know, so, you know, I started carving out the rosewood on the interior, carving out thinner and tap working trying to work with tap tones and tuning that resonator box so but the thing about what I'm doing I may never do any woodworking again for the rest of my life 
I just wanted to take it somewhere. Mm-hmm. And now I've been happy. Like I, you know, the, it's, it sounds better, you know, and, and maybe until I get to a point of dissatisfaction, I might like try a new idea, but I'm not married to the fact of experimentation in instrument design. I'm more interested in music composition. That's like the primary focus is to like really, you know, really develop myself in that area, you know. Very cool. Um, I, I'm sort of jealous hearing you talk about this because uh, I mean, like I've chosen a path of being like an electric guitarist. And so like for me, I feel like I'm very out of touch with the materials. Like for me, it's like you think about amplification or, uh, you know, effects pedals or whatever but um you know just like being in touch with the organic materials sounds very cool Um, i have to say that i learned a ton from someone who was one of the founding employees of paul reed smith okay yeah and uh well when the company got too big he got bored with it and just and left but um so this guy his name i mean what's uh his name is tony smith actually What's the what's the famous guitar? It's Paul. Uh, yeah, Paul Reed Smith or Paul PRS Smith. is the company. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Tony um, taught me. This was like two years ago. So much about carving wood, about resonances of wood, and like he was, you know, it's just like I was able to work in a uh, in a furniture making the huge shop. They allowed me to come in and use the equipment and stuff. And he really took me under his wing and shared with me a lot of good information about materials and how to, you know, and it, it really helped me take it, you know, take it forward. Um, but um, so, yeah, and he, yeah, he has all these guitar blanks uh, that were seconds uh, from the factory. And, uh, you know, he, ma- you know, he's made some fantastic guitars and well, it does matter on electric guitars too. I mean, mm-hmm. most guitar, well, most uh, electric guitars these days are, uh, uh, are focused on the beauty of the grain and uh, rather than the resonance of the wood, we have to go back to, you know, some specialists and also older models, you know, where it does make a difference, the solid wood resonance in the body mm-hmm. I, I guess i've also become very concerned for myself about like ergonomics because my my old les paul is just like it's pulled my shoulders so far down and um so now i have this guitar that like has no headstock and it's like shaped all strange so it's perfectly fit for it's, all it's these lighter different. weight out of, uh, yeah. yeah it's so okay. light it's it's wonderful but um uh yeah i don't know um okay so you're interested in michael tonality but you, your guitar so so are you interested in like refretting the guitar so it, that's an interesting thing. Um, I mean, I I might sometime down the line, but like I've almost sort of like, it's like a sunk cost for me to be into equal division of the octave just because that's what I've committed to with my instruments. But um, like, it seems like the true true temperament might not be worth the investment. Um, my buddy has a company called Microtone Guitars uh, where they have like magnetic fretboards that you can yeah i know i've met him uh he came to austin i can't remember what's his name oh michael kadurka michael kadurka kadurka yeah um he maybe it was somebody else because i think some a few different people have had this idea but um this was in the 1980s okay yeah it's probably not him (laughs) no Uh, you're okay yeah you're younger generation yeah he uh he's going to make electric guitars down the line but you know he's been doing classical guitars for a while and um it, yeah, it's really cool to just see that in 10 seconds you can switch out the temperament <laughs> but yeah. uh, I, I still feel somewhat committed to uh the equal division of the octave but maybe because of the type of music that i do but uh i don't know i mean i'm also curious how you feel about that type of uh you know logarithmic sort of tuning because uh like there's the whole world of zen harmonic i guess they're calling it or like microtonality um where it's, you know, still equal division of the octave, but it's like, you know, 19 tones. Um, and that seems cool, but there's something nice in like, uh, like the combination of natural numbers in ratios 
is a really nice sort of uh, elegant way to approach tonality, I think. Uh, but are you bothered by equal division of the octave? Like, I feel like certain just intonation people are like kind of zealots about it, but I don't get a <laughs> zealous vibe. I don't like the zealot approach, but I have to say that um, I don't, you see, I can, you're saying like the, the kind of music that you're interested in must be melodic and like fast moving or, you know, in, in jazz. Yeah, or like multiple key centers, like a, like a giant steps. I feel like, I don't know that that could be done in just intonation, right? Giant steps. Like, uh, giant steps by Coltrane, where it's like moving by major thirds. We'll just go from B major to uh, E flat major to okay. uh, wherever the next one is. Okay, it's like modulation. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. really interested in. Yeah. Um, see, um, yeah, it just doesn't interest me at all because I'm into harmony, you know, right. and when harmony, like you say, these um, pure, pure intervals, you know, really blend together, you know, so I, mm -hmm. it's just, it's not at all an area that I, you know, uh, am interested in going in. Um, I guess the, the way that I've sort of found myself exploring just intonation is in the rhythmic domain. Um, so a lot of what I do is, you know, still based on those same ratios, but it will just be, you know, displayed as a polyrhythm, basically. I'm curious um, if you have any sense of why it, like, I feel like people don't see that as being on the same spectrum. Like, it's kind of like just intonation, but there isn't like a, a just in tempoation or something like it. Oh, yes, there just... is. Uh, oh, please. Uh, oh, sure. Um, yeah. Um, um... <laughs> Oh God, my brain, um, <laughs> this is stupid. There's this like really, really important who started it all. Um, uh, not the, the composer before Parch who played inside the piano and invented oh, the- Cowell? Cowell, Cowell, the Rhythmicon. Henry Cowell. The Rhythmicon, You're it's right. all taking ratio. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Why, why are you, uh saying that there's been nothing done. oh i'm just saying i feel like uh I, i'm not saying that there hasn't been anything done I'm, i feel like the the main focus seems to be on the uh the way that it comes up in pitch space uh versus like uh like you know people aren't that comfortable rhythmically speaking i, I guess it's maybe because like unless you have like an automated thing that's doing it for you once you get up to some of those ratios it's like that's a hard rhythm to ingrain in yourself. You have to, I'll have to give you a link to uh, Chris Brown. Okay. He's a, a former professor at Mills College. Um, okay, so he's done work with uh, just intonation, a retune, he's retuned piano, as well as applying the Rhythmicon ideas up to like the 13 or 13 against seven or something insane with one hand playing 13 the other you're playing you know it's just like absolutely insane but very interesting to listen to these polyrhythms mm -hmm. that makes me wonder also um i saw that that old video of you uh on the austin news and you had like a, a water yeah. dropping mm -hmm. uh polyrhythm thing do you still use anything like that or no, no that, i mean that was like decades ago and um uh the reason why i don't is that it wasn't really predictable i mean it was like a, a mm. it would it, it wasn't perfect you know like a, the the rate would change you know it was organic so i mean i don't know uh it's no i mean it, it, it wasn't useful musically beyond a certain gotcha. point yeah <laughs> gotcha um yeah interesting. okay but uh but i am i mean i i, I am interested in rhythm and i you know, like like you mentioned, the box bow uh, tool that I made to play my my instrument percussively. Um, you know, and then I, I uh, designed actually last year um, a larger idea of the box bow that plays nine strings. That's called the shoveler, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, so uh, I am interested in in rhythm and also working with um, polyrhythms. I really, really, really enjoy that. Um, but I haven't really progressed to complex rhythms, so complex. I'm really more uh, working with something like, uh, you know, three against two or something, you know, but mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, that's, it, would you say that's like the most important one in some ways? Cause that's like our, our perfect fifth, right? Yeah. That's right. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> a big deal. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, to, I mean, like I saw that modified guitar that you had and it seems very sort of, uh, you know, in the spirit of parch, um, yeah. but it has color coding on it. And, um, I'm curious how you think about that color coding thing, because in some ways I'm trying to get at that, you know, like color palettes and chords and polyrhythms are all the same, you know, thing in some way. Um, or I might be being sort of like woo about it, but okay, it's uh, all frequencies. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so how how do you go about uh, linking color to uh, pitch space? And uh, I mean, do you feel like yours overlaps with parches, or like is there any sort of like quasi universal way that somebody would go about this? Okay. Or is it more associ associations that you have? Yeah, um, so I don't have synesthesia and I don't think of the colors as representing anything emotionally. Um, it's really just a way to navigate the complexity of Justin's nation. We've got like a, a lot of, you know, the pitch, you know, a, lo a long list of pitches, you know, it's just like, oh, okay, this one is in this family, you know, you know, this uh, limit or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just, for me, it's just a purely a, a way to, to block things down into subgroups and navigate. Gotcha. Because it's overwhelming, just intonation. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. But I also wanted to say, like, okay, look in Adobe Illustrator and mm -hmm. look at the color picker. Okay. It's all frequencies, frequency ratios. And you see, like, this family, it, you, you click on, you know, like, give me a set, a palette that will go with this color in Adobe Illustrator. And then it creates these, you know, and it and they look good together mm -hmm. and they're all ratio based. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's all frequencies. Um, but yeah. anyway, um, yeah, um, uh, I actually, I didn't really carefully look at how Parch uses the color subsets. And I didn't, mine looks a lot like on that guitar, it looks a lot like Parchian, you know. And I do that on keyboards as well, but I didn't, I actually never like looked at what he actually, you know, which interval is which color and how he blocked it out. I just thought, you know, of a way to do it. And I just did it, uh, you know, so, and that guitar is a Hawaiian guitar, you know, it's a Hawaiian steel guitar. You know what that means? It's like that the Hawaiian guitar was the first, uh, guitar to be played with a slide and that was real popular in America in the 1930s and that's how I think that's how the blues musicians they first heard because it was it was like a popular music I don't know when you think about slide guitar and uh in blues music as well um um but the guitar I got I bought um a couple of years ago um was a guitar that model that was given away for free if you bought lessons and it was fabricated in Cleveland, Ohio. And it's just a really cheap guitar, but it sounds neat. I mean, it's a, it's a plywood guitar. And, you know, because it, it's got like a, a really tall nut so that it, it's got frets, but it, the strings are raised up high off of the frets. So then you can play it with, with the steel. And sure. I mean, that might be a direction for you to go um, to get into just intonation if you, I mean, you can even raise up the nut on any guitar, right? And pull it up off of the frets and then play with a steel. Um, and that's why I have that uh, fret board all marked up. Um, it, it really works like to divide the string length, you know, in half and three and four or five, blah, blah. And, you know, it, it really works. Um, I just hey, wanted uh, to show you, could I just like- Oh yeah, please. Show you the shoveler. That's, yeah, so uh, the, main difference from the the box bow uh really is that it's bigger it plays more strings gotcha okay does that yeah. sort of like slight curvature uh Curve affect it rep replicates the curve of the hand because i first started to think about rhythmic playing of my instrument using my hand and that but it wasn't uh it clear enough you know I, this has a more defined um yeah, more definition. <laughs> and so uh, to do that type of thing with your fingers, would that just be 
too much like abuse to the fingers basically um, oh, it's not really because i use the palm of my hands and i put okay. rosin on it and it's just it uh, i really i don't um draw blood okay <laughs> good i'm glad to hear that <laughs> um and so uh, that i think i read somewhere that you sort of got uh, an idea for that being inspired by like a harmonica is that right well it no it just turned out to sound like a harmonica and i liked that i i liked it because i just liked the folky association i i i just i was grateful that it sounded like a harmonica because like i kind of want my music to have kind of a folky uh feeling i want to compose for that but um but the the idea really came from hand drumming and dampening you know it's like you know like like uh afro-cuban um drumming i i took some classes and i thought about about that and then played my strings that way very cool so uh, is is the shoveler now taking over the role of the box bow or uh -huh. No, it's just one more component. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess like a brief note on the synesthesia thing. Um, I I saw in Wikipedia uh, on their article about synesthesia, like as this huge list of people that supposedly have synesthesia, and then at the end it says pseudo synesthetes, and it has Scriabin listed, and I'm like. Like that seems like a, a weird distinction to make that he's a pseudo synesthete. Um, and that's kind and of so, mean retrospectively to just say, you know, a hundred years later that this guy doesn't really have it or something. <laughs> exactly. And like, I mean, who am I to doubt that he has synesthesia and, uh, you yeah. know, I don't know how real synesthesia, I guess it, it's real, but like, uh, if you, know, you have it, it's real for you. Yeah. But um, others not really. I feel like anybody that is sort of tuned into that, you know, uh, you know, like frequency type of you know thing that we we're, we're talking about with colors and tones, like yeah, I'll be synesthetic, right? Yeah, or synesthetes. Yeah. Um, Why not? So, um, I guess uh, in terms of the tuning theory, um, I'm curious if you have any sort of uh, interest in like prime numbers or anything like that, uh, because you know that seems to be where mm -hmm. you get like a new pitch identity in um mm -hmm. in just intonation. So. Yeah. Do you end up having like uh, each string, like uh, you can't like do an octave up from the string by any sort of hand movement, right? Like it's just a new string. Right, new sh new tuning on a string, but the way the let's see the the technique that I use in playing a string can kind of change the octave. You know, if I um, really bear down on pressure, the fundamental comes out, but a very light touch will bring out the uh, upper octave. Interesting, okay. So it's not 100% controllable, but yeah. Um, how, I guess, how high in the harmonics uh, do you get? Uh, as far as my tuning, um, you know, my my fundamental tuning and my, my pitch set thing, um, I go to 13, but I'm very uh, kind of, I very much want to make music that I want to hear, and I don't want to make music just to be weird or <laughs> yes. be, you know, um, dissonant or something. It's like if I want, if if it works for me, it has to work for me. And so I, I'm very, I don't want to say tentative, but I'm very, like, careful the way I move into 11 and 13, and I'm, and I'm very slow to go there. Um, it's, I feel in my latest piece, I've, I would say, I would say maybe a little bit cautious because um, I, I want it to sound good. I want to use what the complexity uh, in a musical way. And so um, I find that 13, you, I don't want to sustain it. Although I think some people have. I want it to be just a, a shorter moment, shorter duration, mm -hmm. uh, 11 to 13. Um, but I, I, I've worked most extensively with it on my most recent piece, which it hasn't been released yet, but it's like, it's something I've worked on for two years, last two years, and it's um, coming out as a video. It's gonna be um, released online. Um, awesome. 
Yeah. And so it, it, 11 is kind of like the tritone, right? Tone. And then uh, 13, how, how would you describe that harmonic? Well, 13 if, is, um, what is it? I don't even know. I mean, there's, okay. Uh, thir the 13 like over minor eight. sixth ish. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I think when you uh, do, when you did that presentation where you talked about, um, you know, after hours having the train ring and, you know, yeah. you heard that it was yeah. against the strings. Yeah, I yeah. almost felt like it was that interval. Um, it, do you have any recollection of that or am I just. You almost I, feel it was the 13? I, maybe, but I, I, I might just. What is hilarious about you saying that is that, okay, this is, this is how I am. I have to be like very honest with myself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's like that was decades ago and it's just like, a, it's haunted me. It's like, what can I do? How can I use that? You know, because mm -hmm. I really like it. I like that Doppler effect. And, um, but it's really funny in this, this current piece, um, I have this technique that I call twine carillon, where I just have a piece of fishing line that's tied onto one of my musical strings. And then with rosin, just rubbing that string, it's just a loose, thread okay and it and it plucks the other string and it in a fluttering you know rhythmic way that that sounds like a bell ringing okay and um so um i have uh a kind of it's it's kind of a minor triad kind of ish not really but chord with a 13 and and it sounds exactly like a train whistle and i have i have that I've used that in my my recent piece. It was just like this discovery, you know, that I really liked. Oh. Um, it, that makes me also curious. Um, so, you know, there's like the whole idea of like eutonal and otonal, or I don't know if that's how people pronounce it, but um, yeah, yeah. like the supposed like undertone series. And I'm yeah. curious in your research, if you've uh, gone in a sense well, of whether Even the that's... undertone series. I like right? it. I believe, I'm a believer in the undertone series. Interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, the bass player, Mark Dresser, um, I think he is able to get them on his bass with some technique, but like, I feel like the, the understanding has always been that it's not real, but I'm it's interesting that you're a believer. Um, do you have any other thoughts on the undertone series? Like... <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the, the undertone series is, um, you say in a way it's not real because it's, um, it's a, it's a mathematical, a mirror image of the overtone series mathematically, you know, it's just mm -hmm. using subtraction, but it's like uh, those intervals sound beautiful. You know, I like it, you know, but you know, for me, um, it, uh, it's kind of like the important thing is the voicing, right? It's like, you could put something an octave higher and it become, you know, it's just like, it's sort of like, how you voice a chord the same notes, which octave you place each note in, changes the harmonic meaning of it. And it, and so really the way I work, I have to say is by ear. And if I like something, I just use it. Um, and I don't go back and analyze too much about what it is. I really don't, because I'm busy. I'm like rushing through, like trying to get the thing finished and you know and then moving on to the next thing it's just like i don't want to take the time um so i'm not really thinking hard about you know uh what analyzing exactly the harmonic i just think that um in just intonation um and like also you you mentioned something in that outline about um uh you said uh, composites i really like members of two different overtone series, you know, and just composite like a chain of pitches from one root to something, a member of something else. And that kind of, that, that kind of complexity is interesting to me because it has a mathematical purity still. Mm -hmm. It's just a more distant one. And I, I, I get a bit tired of just hearing the overtone series, the, mm -hmm. you know, the stability and the purity of that, you know, I want to, you know, works with more complexity and that's, that's one way to do it. And, and I like that. 
so by a chain of uh over overtones you mean something like a perfect fifth of a perfect fifth of a perfect fifth well no i mean like one three five seven nine eleven okay you can take the one and you've got and one five seven but then you take the um the also you take the seven of the nine of the one you know so it becomes like a matrix you know it's a relationship mm -hmm. over relationship um it I've just been familiarizing myself with this work, but are you interested in Irv Wilson? Okay, I, uh, what I think I am, but by proxy, because I had a, uh, a very close friend who, who passed away a couple of years ago, Philip Arnatov, who was a huge fan of Irv Wilson. And so Phil is like very, um, very uh, theoretical. And I listened to him quite a lot, talk and demonstrate things. And I think I've, absorbed by osmosis some of Irv Wilson's ideas although when I look at his drawings and things it's like uh opaque I just really don't want to sort through you know the ideas when I look at them on paper I don't want to I just want to use my ear totally I feel like the his little uh, his like uh, lattices that he draws I'm just like that's enough of a piece of art by itself like I I feel like I also don't know that I want to take the time to like you know, plug it into all the different things and hear what it sounds like. But like, I just love seeing those hear it in order for your mind to understand mm -hmm. what it what it is. Yeah, you have to hear it. Yeah, I, I feel like those lattices are very beautiful, though. What? Um, uh, some of his lattices that he draws out are just beautiful pieces of geometry, though. I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's see here. Um, so it, you know, you said that you don't do the water thing anymore, but uh, you have the box bow, you have the shoveler. You have the standard LSI. Are there any other instruments that are in your uh, uh, collection of instruments? Uh, auto harp. I retuned the auto harp and I re um, felted it so that it plays different kinds of chords. And I've composed I've composed some uh, songs with that. Um, uh, they haven't been released. Yeah. Um, gotcha. Um, well, uh, I guess uh, to talk a little bit about your collaboration with uh, Teresa Wong, uh, and you know, I saw that you have that infographic of uh, like that you know chart of the harmonics on the strings that have the yeah. color coding that we talked about. Um, yeah. Uh, and you know that it's I think it said that it ended up in a cello pedagogy book. Yeah. And I'm curious. Um, you know, for me, I feel like I've always had trouble uh, relating to other musicians. Uh, or not always had trouble, but like, I feel like you seem to have a huge amount of ease relating to other musicians, despite having a completely atypical instrument. And so with cello, it seems like there was a blending process where she was like, you know, figuring out how to interact with you and you're figuring out like, wh what was that like in terms of uh, adjusting to connect with a different instrument that, you know, has, I mean, I guess it still has the continuous uh, fingerboard, but, uh, was that difficult at all or like how how do you think about that yeah it's super difficult um uh but the string quartet is the easiest ad adaptable um you know vehicle because uh because of like you say no frets um but also string players are really you know familiar and comfortable with with harmonics you know and and that's the point, starting point um but teresa you know like when you've got classical training You've got equal temperament in your ear and so she really had to undo that it was that was very difficult you know like to and then um you know because we we knew each other when before she was interested in justin's nation and we tried to work together or she would just think that i sounded out of tune and <laughs> you know <laughs> um and we couldn't really get anywhere or or the other uh, uh problem with cello is that uh stepping on each other because like we occupy the same area and if uh really uh the same pitch range okay because like this instrument here in in this room the one i install in here is viola range and this room is 40 feet long so i have to get to get down into the bass or cello range I, it has to be 100 feet long so it's hard for me to find a room that big it's only you know, when I'm on tour or something that I uh, have that. Um, but uh, 
you know, so anyway, then what does a cello do if I'm bowing all the time, you know, what does the cello do so that so we, we had to find a way for the cello to have its own voice, its own space. And we, I think we did, you know, it really had to do with her um, working with um, extended harmonics and coming up with uh, uh, like a vocabulary of pizzicato. And it's really all comes out of Mark Dresser's work. He put out a video called uh, Guts, mm -hmm. where he demonstrates all of these invented um, techniques. And she, she studied that and, um, and also kind of came up with her own uh, ideas too. And um, so that's, that's, and we ended up finding like, you know, where each instrument could, you know, that's, that's important, you know, that each instrument occupies a space, has its own voice, you know, there's interaction, but yet not just smashing each other, you know, where, you know, uh, yeah, so becoming redundant. She didn't want to be redundant, you know, bowing a cello and me bowing, you know. So it's, yeah, it's a really interesting process. Very cool. Um, uh, you know, I, I spoke to Michael Dessen, the trombonist, and um, I, I feel like maybe you're aware of him because he knows or he knew Pauline and uh, he plays with Mark Dresser as well. Um, okay. But I'm curious if you've ever wanted to like collaborate with a trombonist because that seems like another particularly apt instrument right it's a fantastic instrument and to tell you the truth i have a collaboration that i just really love uh with monique buzarte who i mean she comes out of the um the line of um stuart dempster okay you know stuart dempster's work stuart okay. was in deep listening band the trombonist okay. yeah with pauline um and, and also was, you know, a member of the Tate Music Center in San Francisco, going all the way back with Pauline to, you know, I don't know, graduate school or undergrad at SF State. So they really, you know, developed a sound together, Stuart Dempster. And um, Monique studied with Stuart. I've played with Stuart as well. Um, Monique has a super interesting approach because she has hearing loss and her choices of pitch relationship are, are really delicious, like really unusual, but work. So yeah, I have a, I have an album we put out. It's all my, you know, my albums are just kind of buried, you know, but um, we put out an album called Fluctuations on, it was on Deep Listening on the label. And uh, it's on Bandcamp. Excellent. Cool. I'll have yeah. to listen to it. Um, do you feel like uh, instruments with some sort of continuous uh, element and, you know, is that ideal? Like, would a uh, fretless guitar be an ideal guitar collaborator? Um, like, are there other instruments that seem particularly equipped for engaging with the LSI? Uh Let's see, uh, the, another collaboration, well, we haven't uh, really published anything, but I have a colleague on uh, Berlin, um, Conrad Springer, who's designed a mechanical electric guitar. That's, he's controlling it um, using Maxim SP, but it's a real elaborate programmed thing where he can retune the strings on the fly because he has those motorized tuners and they're all open strings. And then he created this solenoid uh, tapping and plucking machine that sits on the um, neck. And so it's all like tuned in just intonation. He's, he's able to, he creates these kind of um, rhythmic patterns that it kind of sounds like uh, finger picking style. Gotcha. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but he's I, also- I'm yeah, oh, go ahead. he's also created, uh, which I haven't uh, worked with yet, but we hope to someday, this kind of disembodied organ where um, using enormous, you know, organ pipes laying around the room and those those are tuned, you know, also in just intonation. Very cool. Um, 
so in your performances uh you know i feel like it's this very like sort of like sacred uh spectacle it seems like like um I mean, just to even see that instrument set up is kind of like you know it's gonna like probably blow some people's minds but like do you feel like uh first of all do you feel like your intention is somewhat therapeutic and secondly do you feel like there is a therapeutic shift in your audience that you can tell um yes and yes <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to be like too therapeutic or too new agey. I'm, I, I just sort of like I, I really want the music to be interesting, you know, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but I think you can't help but like feel some things in the body with resonances that are in tune, and just like also enveloping tones you know and just the concentration level it's sort of like concentrating on a different level where you you think you hear something and you're just really kind of listening for it and then something else appears and it's like such a like a dense sound that has so many different things to listen to that it's it sort of takes you outside of yourself you know and then um you know and it, to me i become more aware of um the beauty of nature you know because I, uh, you know, it's sort of like we are, uh, here we are, um, and we don't really understand everything, but yet there are these systems out there that are larger than us, and I'm sort of feel like I'm, I'm tapping into some universal knowledge, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> totally, yeah. Um... yeah, I mean, and then I studied Indian music for four years, and the, the you know, it's very directly taught that this rock was composed you know like blah blah thousand of years ago and you know and i am imparting it to you and multi-generation after generation imparts these scales and you know this the, it's not even a scale it's it's really like how one note is arrived at and where it goes from there the envelope the you know the kind of chain melodic chains that are for that particular rock or whatever and that is humbling in a good way, you know, but it's also also like participating, you know, in human uh, knowledge or whatever, you know, and just, um, yeah, it's humbling in a good way because music yeah. can be egotistical, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's good. It's really good. I think the best music is where there's an element of humility in the um you know, composer, performer. I guess to just wrap up, um, I, I'd be curious if you could elaborate a little bit on some of the lessons from Pauline Oliveros, because um, I think you mentioned that, like, she had some good guidance in terms of, like, how to, uh, you know, progress in your career or, like, uh, you know, things like getting grants. And um, given that you have such a specific sort of uh, niche that you're in, um, like that seems like you have to be particularly attentive to you know those sorts of questions and um i I'd just be curious if you could elaborate a little bit on it mm -hmm. yeah sure um okay so um pauline initially um you know i was just very inspired by her music and i really i really wanted i really loved this um organ like sound that she created with her uh justin just intonation accordion. Um, in the 1980s, when I heard that, I just thought, oh, I would like to like work in that area somehow and just be able to play like an organ or, you know, that really, really inspired me to create my instrument, you know? Um, and then I was able to work with her, you know, you know, a, a decade later. And that, that was really a, uh, a great proce uh, process it was great to be a young artist and to be taken seriously and to, we had good funding and I was able to just work hard and um, we produced an album and some video and um, it was, it was, a, yeah, that was, having that challenge was a really important step in my um, career. Um, I think like, like uh, there was a, a time in the 1980s where she was thinking about um, franchising her um, 
her uh, foundation to have like uh, uh, branches in different cities and things that we talked about. And then she was talking about to me about, this was in the 1980s, like this is before I wrote a grant, you know, it was like I would, I could write project grants in based on without a budget, basically, you know, just fellowship type grants. But, but she taught me how to make a budget and how to project myself like into numbers that I just really couldn't imagine, you know, but just like she, you know, just like, okay, you know, how much would it, would you need to do this and that and that, and just sort of like expand your, you know, I, I wouldn't say that I acted on it, all of that effectively, but just opening my brain to like, to, to be ambitious financially. Mm. Oh, that was a good thing. Um, but then, uh, you know, I would say I applied that information just like a few years ago, you know, just like thinking about her. And I had to write like a really large uh, budget for this video production thing, you know, and that was, you know, just to, it's sort of like, it takes courage to like, think um, that this could actually happen, this like mm -hmm. really large scale thing, you know. Um, so that, she taught me that. Um, another thing um, that, uh, was a really important, um, was that in that collaboration with her, she introduced the concept of improvisation, which I had never really tried to improvise. And it was like really scary. Like all of a sudden, okay, just improvise, you know, but I, 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 I got used to it and I felt I, I really, it was really meaningful. And then then I started working a lot with improvisers for a while. Um, and it really, uh, you know, technically it helped me play my instrument better because I had to fit my sound instead of just walking all over everybody with this large, you know, drone that just, you know, stomped everyone down. I had to fit my sound in between other sounds. So I had to learn how to taper my sound. And that was technically difficult because I was inventing the whole thing. How do you how do you play more softly? How do you work, play a crescendo? How do you taper that down? You know, I had to like really work on that, all of that techni technically. And, you know, that started with Pauline. So that, that, was, that was good. I would say that she like, she's like the impetus on things that then, you know, like maybe manifest later. And then one other thing that she uh, did for me, which it sounds really kind of funny, but in just before she died in 2016, I had lunch with her and um, and I said, I told her about how touring was making me stressed out and that um, it was kind of, uh, the stress was kind of interfering with, 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 my, inabil with my ability to um, be productive. Like for example, traveling made me throw up. I was so nervous about pulling everything off and getting everything to work that I would arrive somewhere and I would be throwing up and you know and I told her that and, and she said just think it's going to be good and that sounds so ridiculous like what just mm -hmm. think it's going to be good but if you just really put it in your mind hmm, it's going to go okay it's going to be well it changes like the chemistry of how you feel you know and just like so I just like tried that and I didn't throw up. <laughs> <So> <laughs> it works. <laughs> that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, I guess uh, in the remaining few minutes here, um, do you want to talk about your uh, Headlands project or, um, you know, uh, point listeners to anything in particular, um, plug anything, et cetera? Yeah, okay. Um... I don't have anything available really to listen to um, yet. There's gonna be a video, online video produced. Um, I don't even have a title for the work yet. Um, it's something I've been composing for the past two years and it was commissioned by um, a, a Gerbodi Foundation Special Award in the Arts and commissioned by an ensemble called The Living Earth Show. It's a duo of a guitarist, Travis Andrews and um, percussionist 
Andy Meyerson. Um, but I enlisted them to play my instrument, to play the box bow. You know, I, I taught them how to play it and composed parts for those, um, yeah, for them to play. Um, and designed and developed the shoveler in the, along the process, and they also used that. Um, and this is, and, and then I also incorporated this steel guitar because Travis is a guitarist. So I, I composed parts for him to play uh, with slide guitar. And, and for Andy, uh, Andy specialized in marimba. And we we're trying to like come up with some sort of just intonation, um, you know, like hammered instrument. And marimba just seems like really uh, impractical to like tour with, uh, you know, like, uh, just intoned you know, with just intoned marimba bars and whatever you know it's just like you can't come across that or you have to like haul around this huge thing so what we did was um uh just adapted that hammering idea to hammered dulcimer oh, very cool and he yeah he i, I composed it like to i retuned this these strings on a on a dulcimer and and then he uh, you know played this percussive part awesome so that's coming out sometime uh, soon, yeah. Awesome, cool. Um, awesome, well, uh, I think that's probably a good place to end it then. Um, I'll, I'll you know direct people to your website and all that in the notes. Um, Ellen Fullman has been delightful talking to you. Thank you for sharing your time with me and uh, hopefully we talk soon. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, John. I really appreciate the uh invitation and i enjoyed it too <laughs> awesome all right okay i'll talk to you later bye okay. bye, -bye.